Party Dope Dream Team. It's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with top 10 rivalry flashpoints in F1. What's a flashpoint? Is what I'm, I guess I'll learn in this video. Before we jump in, make sure you subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, get a video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. What we got? Even before they were teammates, a collision at a rain-soaked Fuji Speedway in 2007. I can't even see. How do they see? How do they see in this much rain, bro? I can't see crap. Lit the fuse on a rivalry between Mark Webber and Ooh. Sebastian Vettel that would boil over plenty of times over the coming years. And he'd be on the safety car, man. Weber branded Vettel a kid with no experience. Three years later, and the pair, now slugging it out for the title as Red Bull teammates, collided God, again dang. when dicing for the lead at the 2010 Turkish Grand Prix. What the f*** are we doing here? What is stupid action? I'm going home. You. Weber was incensed at Silverstone in 2010 when the team took a new spec front wing off his car to give it to Vettel. But it was in Sepang in 2013 when their long-standing rivalry really hit boiling point. In the final laps of the race, Weber was leading with Vettel second, and the team ordered them to hold station to the finish. What happened next made the term multi-21 famous around the world. Sebastian, multi-map 2-1, multi-map 2-1. Oh, Sebastian, they need to give him the space, hold position. It's wheel to wheel again for the two rebels, Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber. Vettel on the inside. Has he now stolen the lead from his teammate? Can Webber scrap back? Oh, fantastic stuff. Oh! Regains the lead, but the battle is not over yet. And there is barely a meter between the two cars as down the hill they plunge and side by side onwards towards the braking zone at turn four. Webber on the inside. Has he got the better traction? No. Vettel goes dancing oh! on the outside. And it's a dance that takes him into the lead of this race. Wow. Multi-21, Yeah, multi-21. I won a race as well, but in the end, the team uh, yeah, made a decision, uh, which we always say before the start of the race, is probably how it's going to be. We look after the tyres, get the car to the end, and uh, in the end, Seb made his own decisions today, and we'll have protection as usual, and that's the way it goes. God dang. I understand why the team told them not to challenge, right? Uh... Because they could get into another crash like they did that one time and knock them both out the race. Well, either way, Red Bull's taking one and two. So they're good. No, that's it. Like Sebastian, chill out. Sebastian, like, no, I want to win. And so I understand the team's perspective as, like, hold your position. Don't challenge them. Right? Let's keep everybody happy. But from a driver's perspective, I understand it's like, bro, like, I'm not out here racing because I want second place. Like, I want to win. If I have a chance of winning, I want to win. So don't try to tell me to not go for it if I have a shot at it. Like, I don't know how I feel about eat that either. Like, I, I wouldn't like that. Uh, I'm going for it. If, if I got a shot at winning, I'm going for it. <laughs> Simple play. I I uh, messed up in that situation. And uh, obviously, the two... Took, uh, took the lead from Mark, which um, I can see now he's upset. But uh, yeah, I want to be honest at least and stick to the truth and uh, apologize. I know that it doesn't really help um, his feelings right now. 2021 saw the closest title race in years, with Red Bull producing a car worthy of the skills of their wonderkind driver, Max Verstappen, to create a combination that could finally challenge the dominance of Mercedes and the greatest driver of his generation, Lewis Hamilton. No quarter was given as both drivers realized every single point would count, and contact between them seemed inevitable as they battled it out. They came close at Imola in God, round two oh before colliding God. in spectacular fashion at Silverstone's Cops Corner on the opening lap of the British Grand Prix. Verstappen was pitched into the barriers while Hamilton went on to win. Into Cops Corner. These are critical corners for this Grand Prix. Hamilton's going to try again this time on the inside of Continental. Oh my Stephen God. Race and that's a big crash into Cops. Lewis Hamilton and Max 
Max Verstappen coming together. Hamilton continues on. Yay. Four races later, the F1 circus arrived in Monza with just three points separating the two contenders and the pressure ramping up. As the race approached half distance, both drivers had slow pit stops, meaning Hamilton emerged from the pit lane side by side with his rival as they thundered down Ooh. towards the first chicane. And there's Max Verstappen right behind Hamilton into the first chicane. Once again, it's wheel to wheel. Hamilton and Verstappen, oh. and this time Verstappen and Hamilton have crashed out and God damn. both out. What a I know they both freaking heated, but it's like neither of them drive. They're they're both absolutely incredible drivers, and nobody wants to give an inch. Nobody wants to 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 give anything up. So nobody's budging. It's like a game of chicken where neither one of us backing off. So it's like this is the result. And so I guess rivalry flash points are just just rivalries that that happen and are created over time. Or there's. When there's a big reason they happen, and then it just continues. But the two of the top drivers, of course, they're going to be a rivalry. Two of the top guys. Bizarre incident. Oh, my Absolutely God. Bizarre. That's the scary. Into, into the corner, and next thing you know, I guess Max went over the second curb or something like that. He obviously knew at that point he wasn't going to make the corner, and he drove into me. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you ran me a bit too much out of road, so then I clipped uh, the sausage curb, and, and that's why we, we touched. The death of Ayrton Senna had cast a shadow over the 1994 World Championship. But two drivers emerged to fight for the title. Benetton's Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill driving for Williams. Schumacher started the season in terrific form, winning six of the first seven Grand Prix ah, to open hey. up a commanding lead in the title race. But Jeez. thereafter, Hill began to grow into his team leader role while Schumacher fell foul of the rules at Silverstone and Spa, being disqualified from both races as well as being banned Dang. for a further two. Hill seized his opportunity and took a flurry of victories in the second half of the year, meaning when they arrived in Adelaide for the season finale, the Englishman was just one point behind. From P2 on the grid, Schumacher darted into the lead of the race at the start, with Hill following, and so it remained until lap 36. Schumacher's off, Schumacher's lost time, yeah. Hill goes by. Oh, oh. Out, go, out goes Schumacher. The German is out of the Australian Grand Prix. Yeah, I would say that was on Schumacher. I don't blame him. Hey, something happened with Schumacher's car. Schumacher's off, Schumacher's lost time, yeah. Hill goes by. Oh, out, yeah, go, out Schumacher. goes Schumacher. The German is out of the Australian Grand Prix. Damon Hill only has to keep going to be world champion of 1994, but can he That's keep crazy. going? And Hill shaking his head. He knows in his heart of hearts that it is all over. It's over now, and it's a bit of a, an empty feeling, but I think I gave him a good run for his money, and uh, he certainly was feeling the pressure because uh, he ended up falling off the road. And the car oh, was, was handling a bit uh, difficult, but I didn't have a lot of time to find out how was the handling because uh, suddenly I found myself up in the air. Dang. Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg had been childhood friends, karting teammates and fierce competitors from their earliest years in racing. But could any friendship survive the white heat of a Formula One title battle? The first cracks in their relationship appeared in Monte Carlo in 2014 when Rosberg was accused of deliberately ruining Hamilton's final run in qualifying, before the two Mercedes teammates made contact on track in the Belgian Grand Prix. Oh, and uh, to be fair, Hamilton has actually got more of a He's front wing now. Uh, He's got to puncture Lewis Hamilton. Nico Rosberg's lost a bit of front wing. And for the first time this season, we've seen the two Mercedes drivers coming together. Nico hit me. In 2015, Rosberg accused Hamilton of compromising his race in Shanghai and of forcing him wide at Turn 1 in Austin, a race the Briton won to secure a third world title. Oh. Rosberg was not amused by that, or by Hamilton helpfully throwing him his podium cap in the cool-down room after the race. But in 2016, Rosberg turned up the heat, oh. winning the first four Grand Prix of the year. And then they came to Barcelona. Round 
turn three we go, and it's Nico Rosberg and Hamilton's onto the grass, and Hamilton's had a massive crash, and he's crashed into his teammate. The two Mercedes come together as Hamilton tries to pass on the inside, and he can cover his hands over his eyes, and he won't want to see that again. I was in the lead, um, closed the door, and uh, he went for the gap anyways. Went to the right, and there was a gap there, but it, it closed. Ah, dang, I'm loving these rivalries, though. I mean, what are sports without great rivalries? They're needed. Somebody needs to be seen as a hero. Somebody, somebody needs to be seen as a villain. It's in life, not in just sports, but in life. You, always, you need your heroes and you need your villains. Uh, but keep it going. Ayrton Senna versus Alain Prost is arguably the most iconic rivalry in Formula One history. The Brazilian joined Prost at McLaren in 1988, when their Honda-powered car was almost untouchable. It was all smiles as the season got underway, but Prost was furious at the Portuguese Grand Prix, accusing Senna of crowding him into the pit wall at top speed as they battled for the lead. Prost having a look, and Senna's crowding him into the pit wall, and Prost is on, I would think, full boost, and Prost goes through to take the lead. Senna went on to take the title after a brilliant comeback drive at Suzuka. But 12 months later, animosity between them had grown and their championship deciding collision in Japan is the stuff of legend. Ayrton Senna has to win today as he had to win last year to win the world championship. during the race Dang. and we're about to see Ayrton Senna retake the lead I think he's got vastly superior power and through now Nanini smokes up oh my Ayrton god Senna wins in Japan is there going to be a stewards inquiry Alain Prost will have one if he can Senna was later disqualified for using an escape road to rejoin the track oh. handing Prost the title the Frenchman quit McLaren anyway, saying he could no longer work with Senna. To be very honest, I mean, I'm quite happy to, to leave because I think it's, uh, it becomes absolutely impossible to work with Ayrton. But incredibly, there was yet another Japanese title showdown between them the following oh. year. With Prost now driving for Ferrari, the pair qualified first and second. But Senna vowed he wouldn't let Prost get into the first corner ahead of him. And history soon repeated itself. The grid is clear, the lights go, and Senna sprints away, but Alain Prost takes the lead, it's happened, hey. Alain Prost has taken the advantage, Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and God it's immediately, day. this is amazing, Senna goes off at the first corner, but what has happened to Prost, he has gone off too. I'd be so heated bro, I would be so so freaking hate it. Oh, uh, yeah, these rivalries begin to a boiling point. They definitely get to a boiling point. I wonder, if, like, as it is, I got to look, is there a top 10 fights? Anybody just got out the car and just started throwing hands? I, I, I got to see that. Well, that is amazing, but I fear absolutely predictable. Fortunately, it went wrong on the first corner. There was a big risk. Uh, I had uh, nothing to lose on the first corner. I want to win and I went for a gap in inside on the first corner. Alan didn't, didn't see it and just closed the door and we ended up touching. That's, last year I lost in a similar manner towards to the end of the race instead of the beginning. And this year went wrong for him. So immediate and effective was Lewis Hamilton's impact as a rookie in 2007 that it rattled the reigning two-time world champion. He showed he feared no one when he pulled off a superb overtake on the Spaniard around the outside of Turn 1 at the opening race in Melbourne. And from that moment on, Alonso knew he'd have to bring all his skills to beat his young teammate. There was tension all year long, with Hamilton feeling he was denied a chance of victory in Monaco and Alonso venting his frustrations in Montreal and Indianapolis. But when the title fight headed to Hungary, the tension boiled over into an all-out war. In qualifying, Hamilton failed to let Alonso through on track as agreed. 
and the Spaniard retaliated with a calculated strike of his own as he sat in the McLaren pit box just long enough to deny his young rival a final run at taking pole position. Yay! We wait for the countdown in the radio and we go. Sometimes it's 10 seconds, sometimes 45 seconds, like the first stop of today. Sometimes 10 or 15, like the second, but I think the calculation was wrong because my teammate didn't complete the lap and I crossed the line with two or three seconds. So it was really, really tight. And, uh, you know, these, these things unfortunately happened today to us. The stewards later stripped Alonso of pole for his actions, dropping him to P6. While in the end, neither McLaren driver took the title as Ferrari's Kimi Raikkonen surprised them both by snatching it by a single point at the final race. <laughs> Well, the yeah, it's, it, it's, it's hard. That's why I feel like it's hard to have like teammates in in this race where like you don't finish first as a team. Like when Ricky Bobby, when old dude wanted to come first, when his teammate wanted to come first, he's like, "Well, if you get first, like how am I gonna get first? Like you feel it? it's hard because it's like I want to win. You want to be the best in the world. You have that desire." But your teammate also has that same desire. So it's like, how? and if you're both absolutely amazing, how does the tension not start? How do you not compete with each other? How does the tension not boil over? Like, both of you want to be the best, so you're going to butt heads. So I feel like it's hard to be teammates because of that reason. It's hard to have a teammate in this sport. So I feel like when you're on that track, we might be driving for the same brand or whatever. But I don't know if we're necessarily teammates. 1982 turbo cars were some of the fastest and most brutal in the sport's history. The season itself was marred by controversy, strike action, political infighting and tragedy. Ferrari's 126C2 car was a rocket and both Gilles Villeneuve and Didier Peroni were tipped as title contenders. But the season started poorly for the Scarlet cars with Peroni's sixth place at Brazil, their Ooh. only points finish in the first three races. At Dang. Imola, the Ferraris had the chance to get their season up and running when a boycott meant only 14 cars arrived for the Grand Prix. Oh, wow. On race day, the fast but unreliable Renaults of Alain Prost and René Arnoux dropped out, oh, wow. leaving Villeneuve and Peroni to fight it out for the lead in front of a delighted partisan crowd. As the laps ticked down, a Ferrari pit board sent out a simple order to the drivers. Slow. Villeneuve believed that meant hold position, but Peroni had other ideas. He's going to come down the inside. He's got it. Boy's going wide. Oh. Oh. Fantastic stuff. They've changed places from two laps running in Peroni now. All he has to do now is keep it pointing the right way. The last of the late breakers, Peroni has shown himself to be with that masterly maneuver on the last lap in this San Marino Grand Prix. The Canadian's body language on the podium spoke volumes. Oh. He was incensed and vowed to never speak to Peroni again. Oh, wow. Tragically, he was killed just two weeks later during qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix at Zolder. While later that Dang. year, Peroni suffered a career-ending injury at Hockenheim. Oh my God, that is... Carlos Heutemann was already a race winner in F1 with both Brabham and Ferrari, but when he joined Williams in 1980, he did so on the understanding he would move over for team leader Alan Jones if asked. Jones took the title in their first year together in dominant fashion. But at the second race of the 1981 season, the Brazilian Grand Prix, the pair were out in front, with Jones staring at Heutemann's exhaust for lap after lap, but not mounting any attacks for the lead, fully expecting his teammate to pull aside in the dying moments to fulfill the terms of the agreement. Despite the team hanging out a pit board declaring their expected finishing order, Heutemann was in no mood to relinquish what he thought was a deserved win and crossed the line in P1. If he didn't like the contract, he shouldn't have signed it, said a livid Jones, who refused to stand on the podium alongside his teammate. Heutemann admitted he'd gone back on his word, but said he simply couldn't bring himself to give up the victory. That is, dang, so you, do you sign, you, in the contract, they tell you, like, who our lead guy is, and like, hey, like, if you're not the lead guy and y'all in one, two position, you in one position, you need to move over and let the, and let our top guy through. 
Is that like in the contract? That'd be, that's insane. Nelson Piquet was already a two-time champion when he joined Williams in 1986. While his new teammate Nigel Mansell had just two wins to his name in Formula One. But if the Brazilian didn't expect to be challenged by a man he had written off as an uneducated fool, he was soon put right on that score. And as they arrived at Brands Hatch for the British Grand Prix in July, Mansell had three wins to Piquet's one. Keen to assert his authority in the team, Piquet insisted on having first dibs on the spare car, being set up for his driving style. But after his drive shaft failed on the first start at Brands Hatch, Mansell took Piquet's spare for the restart, necessary after a big lap one shunt oh had stopped the God. race. Then harried the Brazilian into making a gear shift mistake, which allowed the Briton to take the lead. He then fended off Piquet's attacks to take the win in front of his ecstatic home crowd. Mansell is the winner! Great stuff! Wonderful drive! A magnificent drive in the spare car! Well done! The crowd is roaring its approval! There was no post-race handshake between them, as the two men, never friendly to begin with, became ever more suspicious and ever more determined to beat the other. But just like Hamilton and Alonso two decades later, the feuding teammates would both miss out on the title, as Alain Prost beat them in what was an undoubtedly slower McLaren. The 1997 Formula One World Championship went down to the wire, with two men in contention at the final race in Jerez, Michael Schumacher and Jacques Villeneuve. Spent all the three weeks, two weeks, uh, leading to that last race, reminding people what happened to Damon. Just bring that, and, and I think that put a little bit of pressure on, on Michael, to the point where the FI said, if something like this happens, that driver will be disqualified. No, nothing nasty has to happen on the track. But we went into that race knowing we would come out of it the winners. There was no other option. With the German leading by a single point, qualifying for the season-ending European Grand Prix was one of the tightest in the sport's history. Incredibly, three drivers posted the exact same fastest time, 1 minute 21, oh with 072 God. seconds, with the Canadian given pole for setting the benchmark first. Schumacher lined up P2 on the grid and got a fantastic start, putting his Ferrari Ooh. into the lead at the first corner. But Villeneuve, son of legendary Ferrari racer Gilles, wasn't done yet. Villeneuve is oh. all over him, look. He's going he's through. Still. Oh, yes. Oh. Help. I don't think. Help goes Michael Schumacher. That didn't work. That didn't work, Michael. You hit the wrong part of him, my friend. I don't <laughs> think that will cause Villeneuve a problem. We had discussed this and playing with the team, with Jock, with my friends, and we were 100% sure that if there was the opportunity, then it, the, the opportunity would be taken. And, and that's why when I got next to him and we hadn't banged wheels yet, I was surprised. And it just came a little bit later. And if Villeneuve can just keep going in the points, he's won the World Championship of 1997. Hey. Villeneuve managed to nurse his stricken Williams home in third, losing two places on the final lap, winning the World Championship by three points, while Schumacher was later disqualified from that year's championship for his actions. And it would be three more years before he tasted title success with Ferrari. Nah, these rivalries are crazy, bro. These rivalries are insane. Ah, uh, oh, I absolutely love them. I'm absolutely loving them. And I feel like it, it's I, a lot of the times the rivalries be, to be between the teammates <laughs> driving for the same uh, brand or sponsor, but everybody wants to win. What do you do is if you got a team, there's only one winner. What do you do? That's all we got. You guys got a favorite video suggestion? You can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. It's your boy D Neil out.